Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Ich bedanke mich herzlich für die Einladung. Ich habe mit Thank you very much for the invitation. I talked to Mr. Coelho about uh, the uh, research and the results, and I am just going to uh, stick to uh, that that I've had experience with. Now he understands uh, all of the details himself. Now, just on the procedure, there's a difference with uh, echelon, with prism and uh, tempura. We had the documents. It wasn't the same detective work that was necessary. Nevertheless, there is still work to understand the exact details. When you look at the files, the data that uh, Snowden made public, you need to really sit down and look at that to understand uh, the terms. They're not necessarily that easy to understand. So the end of the process, it's very important to understand exactly what this system is capable of. And only when you can fully understand it, can you uh, politically evaluate it and draw conclusions from that. So it's very important to put that effort in and to really understand the full capabilities of the system. Second, and I say this from experience, it's very important in terms of the report to do this uh, work very seriously. It's important to, and to look at all the uh, data carefully that you're putting in the report to check the sources, to check the plausibility uh, where this information comes from. That is going to really uh, improve the quality of your report. Um, just a recommendation when it comes to the work, I think you have up until December that at a coordinator level you come to a con an agreement about what you want to work on in terms of content so that there isn't suddenly a disagreement about how to proceed. This would uh, be counterproductive and, and you'd lose valuable time that you don't have. I would also say it's very useful to use the expertise uh, uh, from the American Congress, from the British Parliament, for example, they have excellent material related to the information that you are now looking into. Secondly, what needs to be uh, clarified now, the Echelon, echelon um, study that I have experienced showed uh, the wide scope of what an intelligence service does, uh, what's, what's technically possible, what's uh, finance, what's in the interests of the country and uh, what's legally allowable. Now, we don't know what they do that's outside of the law, but if you look in a lot of detail about what the legal, uh, what's legally allowed for an intelligence service, that's very interesting to look at. That can be very helpful. Secondly, I would also advise you to take the necessary time to understand the technical process. So with the uh, communications, surveillance, how this is actually done, the machines that are necessary, uh, that are used uh, by the intelligence services, these uh, can be um, a technology uh, companies who make this, who, who put this on the market. There are also companies who are active in other areas who carry out data mining and they could, it might also be very useful to invite such a company to explain everything that can be done uh, around data mining. Third area that wasn't a problem at the time but is now the NSA now uh, has outsourced a lot to 
private companies around 70 percent uh, so it's not just within the nsa itself anymore uh clearly that uh, uh, is something I think we can see in the uh, Snowden case, the, the consequences for the security. So even even their own, uh, even the phones that they use is outsourced. So uh, some of this is, uh, as I said, in the hands of private companies, and this can lead to problems. So that's something else you should look at in terms of the report. Now, uh, who can be helpful uh, based on our experience? Uh, governments, I think, won't have much interest in helping you. That was certainly our experience at the time. You might not always hear the truth. We were lied uh, to uh, from the American and British uh, sides as to this uh, agreement they had, this corporation they had. And, and of course there was this agreement. If you look at national parliaments, you will see that they're, uh, they're not necessarily willing to share their work and uh, they don't necessarily want someone from the EU there either. So these are all things that you have to bear in mind if you want to invite an oversight committee, for example investigative journalists can be extremely helpful um, to give you uh, tips here but it's also as I said important to look at the sources and the plausibility there are two types of investigative journalists those who are truly investigative journalists and those who are creative journalists shall I say So there are those who are more interested in just selling a story than in the truth behind the story. So I'm simply saying, uh, take everything with a pinch of salt. Don't take everything on face value. You need to check this yourself. The next issue is security uh, within the EU institutions. We've heard that the Washington uh, representation uh, has been uh, bugged. countries uh, don't have friends they have interests so that's what we need to remember for us it's very important and even back then we uh, criticized the lack of a uh, counter uh, spying measures that we had within the EU we don't even have uh, the countermeasures a big company would have in place so I'm talking about the Commission, about the Council. I don't think it's acceptable that the uh, EU representation in Washington doesn't have a, a proper secure room. Other embassies have that because uh, you, you know that you might be spied upon even amongst so-called friends. It's also important to look at certain issues and if they're in line with EU law, looking at national uh, legislation, what uh, can be used as safeguards. Now, when I had sent an email, for example, from one country to uh, another country, it was over the shortest distance. But today, you don't know exactly uh, where this uh, data packet goes it could go via America or go via China for economic reasons but you can put national legislation in place to say that national legislation has to go through national channels and uh, this in, in this particular case that could be something that's useful uh, secondly those uh, on a flat rate If you have a flat rate, you need to be aware uh, when you look at your uh, data and how that is processed and how that's used. Now, it, this can be outsourced to American 
companies, for example, and then they have the right to look at this metadata. So you have to look very carefully at the billing and to see uh, if you can uh, what's happening with the processing of the data and if that's going out of the country. And if you're going outside of the uh, EU, you, then you're going to have problems. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and apologies for having to leave you. Vielen Dank, unser, vielen Dank, unser ehemaliger Kollege Herr. Thank you very much to our former colleague, Mr. Schmidt. Okay. Yes. Now, we turn back to the first part of the session, which is back again to Mr. Applebaum. Mr. Applebaum, you've got the floor. Thanks so much for, for having me. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. This is my first time in uh, European Parliament. Um, so I, I sort of wanted to take a broad view of someone who um, has some experience with this. I've spent the last decade working in a kind of censorship resistance field. I work on the Tor network. It's an anonymity network that people can use so as to not be surveilled and to bypass censorship. Um, it's actually funded by the U.S. State Department, the Swedish International Development Agency, and um, it's a free software project. However, I'm here more in my capacity as an independent journalist, as an investigative journalist, but also as a person who has been subject to extreme scrutiny under these types of surveillance programs. Um, so with that said, um, I definitely want to talk about the NSA, and I will, but I want to have a, a, a broader view, because part of what we've learned from Snowden and his whistleblowing in the public interest is that the NSA has an all-encompassing spy program, essentially. But what is not really well described in public yet is how it is actually the case that the FBI and the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States also have similar access programs. So, for example, when people talk about these um, PRISM-like programs or PRISM itself, what, the, what that name actually means is it's a program where people in corporations – or perhaps uh, nonprofits of any kind or simply uh, organizations are, are complicit in helping the government, either because they are forced under the FISA Amendments Act, um, FAA 702, I believe, is the specific FISA Amendments Act that they are using in the United States. And in this case, Google, for example, or Yahoo, or Skype, or Microsoft, they have either <coughs> systems inside of their networks or attached to their networks where they are willingly and knowingly assisting in secret interception, and that would be the PRISM program, or there are significantly more serious business record-like legal instruments, which don't really even have a name other than business records. Um, so, for example, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States has a thing called a National Security Letter, of which I believe I am actually a subject, uh, which is a, a kind of interesting story for another time. But um, these are generally considered to be unconstitutional in the United States, and judges have ruled that. And it appears that each branch and each agency has something that is like a National Security Letter. And in the case of the business records, it, it, it seems, in fact, significantly worse than a national security letter. So it's not just a matter of metadata. It's, in fact, whatever business records. So that's any record a business may create or that you may create with a business. So if we consider PRISM and then we consider the fact that they have hardware that's inside of these networks or on site of these computer systems, it really is everything unless there is specific pushback inside of companies. And this we could call PRISM. But it's actually more than just one program. PRISM is just one program, and there are many programs that are like this. And there's another, there's another word which has been used quite a lot for companies that maybe don't fit exactly to that mold, and it's been called upstream. But upstream is more of a description. That is, it's rather how it is that they're doing it technologically. Um, it sort of suggests that there's a little bit less complicity with the people that are targeted, but what it suggests is that if they can't monitor someone directly or can't reach inside of an organization, they monitor any communication with that organization. So that is, they are upstream of that company, of those entities, of those systems. So the Tempora system, 
which is the full take collection system running in the United Kingdom by GCHQ. This is a system in the sense that they are the entire internet leaving and entering the United Kingdom. And any packet, any piece of data that flows through the United Kingdom goes into Tempora and it is stored for, as of the last time I've heard, at least three full days. So that's every single thing. It's not just metadata, all data. Right? So that kind of system, combined with something like PRISM, is a surveillance apparatus that the world has never seen before. When Duncan Campbell revealed Echelon to the world, it was pretty terrifying. It was a very impactful thing for me. But when he revealed it uh, to the world, I didn't imagine it could actually become so much worse. But Echelon, by comparison, um, is the kid stuff that hackers create these days. And the systems that we are seeing Snowden having revealed through Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, um, these systems are so advanced. Um, the way that these systems work and the way that these programs work is, is really, it's, it's a three-phase approach. The first is through complicity, either with so-called legal instruments. The second is by just normal surveillance and spying, which is the upstream. And then the third is what has recently been talked about as the Genie program. This was recently revealed uh, in the Washington Post. But Genie is just one of many programs for tactical exploitation. So that is to say that they want to know what it is that you're doing. And so they can't monitor you upstream. They can't go to Google to get your information, so they break into your computer system. And according to what the Washington Post has recently revealed, there are th tens of thousands of systems which have been compromised by the NSA in an active way under just the Genie program. There are other programs like that that I'm familiar with which have not yet been revealed in public, which will be revealed in good time, where they are targeting specific pieces of software, where they are targeting specific types of people, and where they are specifically doing it for people that are not terrorists. And in fact, in some of the things that are clearly uh, noted in some of these documents, it is the case that the terrorist is the exception. So if they have 30 cases, one of them might be a terrorist. This is something that's very concerning, because with a full take collection, it is necessarily the case that you have every single person surveilled, and naturally, one or two of them may be terrorists accused, suspected, not even convicted, certainly not indicted. Um, so this is a, something which is also very important to keep in mind. These people have not actually been formally charged in any way, and yet they are painted in this way. So in fact, for the most part, people that are targeted in this way and that are under this surveillance, none of them are really terrorists in this case. There are some special exceptions, but it's important to recognize how these things tie together because it's very boring just to talk about technology. And in fact, since almost no one understands the technology, it's a waste of time. Instead, what we can talk about is the things that people really do understand, which is that with the Five Eyes program, and that is to say the Defense Signals Directorate of Australia, um, CSE from Canada, the GCSB from New Zealand, GCHQ from the United Kingdom, and the NSA from the United States, they have formed a partnership such that Despite the American Revolution against the British, GCHQ can query the NSA's databases of American citizens, where they have similar full take collection systems. How that's legal is completely beyond me. How that, for example, is democratic, how it represents upholding my country, uh, it, it to me is, is a quite a dumbfounding thing because, in fact, I'm sure the British feel the same when the NSA queries their, their system. And I would be quite upset about that as well. But looking at this, those are what are called first tier partners. So those are the partners, GCHQ and NSA are first tier partners, and the others are, are second tier partners. BND, that's the Bundesnachrichtendienst of Germany, um, they are a third tier partner. My understanding is that it's not unlike BitTorrent uh, piracy sharing sites in that you have a quota to fill. And so if you're a third, a third tier partner, you have to contribute some information to be able to query some information out. Not totally clear on how this works, but it is an interesting distinction between the different tiers. And this ultimately comes together to be used in, uh, in, in really egregious ways. So for example, there exists signals emission databases and fingerprint or signature databases where you have a particular uh, signature for your voice, you have a particular set of selector or selector-like objects, that is your email address, your phone number, things like that. Anytime you pick up a new device and you enter these 
selector-like objects into this new device, that new device becomes linked to you if it passes by one of these sensors. What that means is that there exists a sort of emergent pattern-based identity system for the entire planet and every person that is on the planet. And then this data is fed into geographic tracking systems. The NSA and the CIA have a system whereby they track people, and the slogan is, we track them, you whack them. This is published, I believe, in the Washington Post most recently. So it is the case that the surveillance data is tied directly into flying robots that kill people without process, right? So the surveillance has a huge impact on people in a very literal sense, like with rockets. So in, in, in this case, this is almost all passive. The first two parts of what I mentioned are passive. The tactical exploitation is not, is not passive. But I want to dispel the myth of the passive NSA, which is that they're just some guys, some really cute mathematicians with pocket protectors, and they're just like doing math and breaking codes, and they're like heroes in these World War movies. It's really, I mean, there are people that are like that in the NSA, and there are some really incredible, um, there are some really incredible people that do work there that are good people, and many of them actually have left to blow the whistle like Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and Edward Snowden. In, in actuality, though, these people are doing active operations. So, for example, I've become familiar with a program which has not yet been revealed in public where they uh, instruct agents of the NSA to be able to go uh, to uh, an urban area to penetrate people's house networks, like their home wireless network. This type of a program is like the modern black bag job of uh, you know a digital era, to go and break into your house is a, is the kind of stuff you would see in a Cold War movie, and they have training slides, in fact, for doing exactly that electronically when they can't get in another way. These these kinds of systems and these kinds of uh, programs are extremely terrifying because they're not democratic by their very nature. They're secret. They're without oversight. Whatever oversight might exist is mostly meaningless because those people who are doing the oversight have so much trust, and so little education. And this is the key thing. Most of the people in the US Congress that I have become familiar with in any way, um, they, they have other people print their email for them. They don't really understand how the electronic world works. None of them can tell you what TCP IP is. Very few of them understand what, what wiretapping is in, in actuality. And what we're, what we're actually seeing here is that the architecture itself of these systems is left vulnerable on purpose. So there exists encrypted fax machines, for example. We know that the, 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 European, um, uh, the European Parliament was intercepted. I believe it was the European Parliament that was intercepted for, uh, I think it was a crypto AG encrypted fax machine. And it looks like they did what we would call a tempest attack, which is that they looked for electronic emissions from the encrypted device. And then from that, they were able to recover this the actual pre-encrypted fax data, which is to say that they were not, they didn't break the encryption, they went around the encryption. Um, so what we see is that there are some architectural changes that change the type of attack that is possible, which means it changes the economic scale and it changes, in fact, the ability to carry out the attack in some cases. So in this case, when we have so-called lawful interception programs, what we need to recognize is that the NSA is not bound by European laws and they do not care what your laws say. So when you say it will be proportionate and balanced to be able to wiretap people for the purposes of terrorism, you are also tacitly endorsing the NSA to wiretap everyone in your country without any judicial process, without any proportionality whatsoever. This is what happened in Greece with the Athens affair, almost certainly. We don't know that it was the NSA, but it was an actor with sufficient capabilities, and they were able to wiretap the prime minister as well as members of parliament and it also moves the risk from uh, a world where it was military to a world where uh, you have someone that operates a computer and they're the last line of defense between your prime minister being wiretapped and not. And in the case of uh, the Vodafone incident in Greece, the person in charge of that telephone switch was found hanged to death in his apartment. And the reason is because he's not trained, he wasn't trained to do these things or to defend an entire nation in that way. So it changes the balance of power in a very serious, uh, serious fashion. So um, with that said, there exists a series of sensors around the entire planet. And these sensors actually, um, I mean, you can think of the entire planet if you could visualize, I'm a very visual person, so visualize a globe of the world. And now imagine there are electronic emissions from this globe. The NSA's job is to capture all of it. 
including what goes into space, and they do. So where there are interesting communication satellites, there exist communication satellites behind those satellites. What do you suppose that those satellites do? Interesting things to look into. But if we look at the Internet and we look at telephone systems, when the NSA is unable to actually get access to a system through some kind of complicity or through, through some kind of data sharing program, they repurpose things that are already there. So when we look at programs like X Keyscore, for example, we see that they have coverage in places where we know that the state would, whichever state that might be, would absolutely not give this data willingly. How is it that they have that? And the answer is that they implant or they put a rootkit into these systems and they extract this data. And when they do searches, they're able to actually do real-time searches with the selector and selector-like objects to pull things out of that entire, that whole globe of electronic signals to feed it back to one of the massive data repositories. So for example, in the Bluffdale, Utah facility, this is meant to store more than 100 years of data. So if we think about these systems as a whole, we actually have a planetary surveillance system that is not accountable to the people that is used for extrajudicial assassination in addition to other things. And one of the only hopes we have is to use encryption to change the way and to change the economic value of such interception. We can't stop people from spying, but we can lower the value of that spying. So I look forward to talking more about this, and uh, also thanks again so much for having me here. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Applebaum. Now, let me, before getting started with the discussion ahead, let me inform you about the way to proceed. At 4.30, 45 minutes from now, we have planned a video conference with a third guest, with a third witness here, Mr. Arlen Rusbridger, the Editor-in-Chief of The Garden. So we've got some 45 minutes to go for the discussion, and uh, I suggest we get started by the rapporteur, the shadow rapporteurs, and then some additional floor for the members willing to intervene, but I just remind you that this is a hearing. So we're here to discuss or to put specific questions to our witnesses here from this side of the podium, not to, I mean, not to linger on political statements.